Welcome to Asian American Life. I'm Ernabel DeMillo. We have a terrific show ahead as we take a look at changemakers who are paving the way in the arts and literature. And what better place to do our show right here at the New York Chinese Scholars Garden in Snug Harbor, Staten Island. This garden was made and designed with reflection and contemplation in mind and draws thousands of visitors every year. This is a place where a scholar would retire to in order to be able to come back to center as a place that everything within their garden has some sort of a symbolism or characteristics that you want to internalize for yourself. You're not actually taking the time to look around and notice, oh wow, there's a really great plant over there, or look at this beautiful, you know, look at the beautiful moon that's flying, you know, that's rising up um, onto the side. And so this garden, by having to go left and right, up and down, you're forced to slow down. It feels as if you're on vacation, you've completely left New York City. And how often do we have this experience to come to some place? You can listen, like right now, you can hear the breeze that is coming through here. You can look at the water with the fish in the space. You can see all of the small details in the architecture that's here that walking down any other block, you don't get to see and experience. And we want visitors to leave having that peaceful feeling of like, <sighs> having that moment of seeing how diverse you could have nature and stonework and um, even the flooring of how things can be so different but then work together really well. This garden is one of New York City's hidden gems and you'll feel like you've been transported to another part of the world. Now, here's a look at what's ahead on our show. My special report on the rise of book bans and censorship. Five Generations on Mott Street, author Ava Chin traces her family roots. Musician Ravi Shankar collaborated with the Beatles and CUNY is documenting his works. Weaving tradition and the art of Korean textiles. Plus, an ancient brew is becoming one of the hottest drinks in the wine world. This and more on Asian American Life. Banned Books Week, usually held in September, will take place the first week of October this year. The theme, Let Freedom Read. And book activists say that this event is more important than ever as book bans, challenges, and censorship have spiked in the last year. They convinced me I only had a few good years left. They can keep their lies. For I have just gotten started. I feel as though I just left the womb. My 20s are the warm-up for what I'm really about to do. Rupi Kaur is a New York Times best-selling author. Her book of poetry, Milk and Honey, has sold millions of copies and is a favorite among teen girls. But Kaur also made another list. Milk and Honey is one of the many books that have now been placed on the banned list in Texas. The book, a collection of poetry that features themes of violence, abuse, and love, was one of the top banned books in America in the 2022-23 school year, according to a report by the free speech advocacy group, PEN America. Author Fatima Sheikh is a PEN America trustee and former co-chair of the Children and Young Adults Book Committee. It doesn't surprise me that people are fearful. It is human nature to be fearful. It surprises me that people are giving in to their fears. Book publishing and writing is a sort of courageous act. You know, you're supposed to have courage when you write a book. When she joined the committee in 2015, there were few book challenges. Today, it's a different story and cultural climate as conservative parents and groups push to take books off the shelf. More than 2,500 titles were targeted in 2022-23. According to the American Library Association, that is the highest number of challenges and restrictions since the ALA started tracking data more than 20 years ago. The targeted books cover a range of subjects, including violence and abuse, grief and death, sexuality, LGBTQ themes, race and racism books that have already been banned due to Republican measures. The Life of Rosa Parks. This apparently is too woke by the Republican Party. Sheikh, a retired professor, has written several children's books and is author of the critically acclaimed Economy Hall, 
the hidden history of the Free Black Brotherhood. She says we shouldn't be challenging books. Instead, books should be challenging us, including young children. When you're in a classroom with a book, it may be uncomfortable, but you can have a conversation about it, and that is the place where it would start. So you can have these wonderful, holistic conversations about literature, about language, about history, about race. It's not scary, it's what went on. Classroom conversations about race was what author Maggie Takuda Hall hoped her children's book would lead to. She decided to write Love in the Library in 2017, when President Trump passed an executive order banning Muslims. And I was so angry and so scared. And I was trying to think of what I had to offer kids in like a really frightening time. And I realized I had this beautiful story in my family, not just about the cruelty of those kinds of policies, but also about the incredible strength and resilience of the people who they victimize. Love in the Library is based on the true story of how her maternal grandparents met in a Japanese incarceration camp during World War II. Candlewick published the book in 2022, and this year she got an email from Scholastic, one of the largest, if not most influential, children's publishing company in the world. But her elation soon turned into disappointment. In that same email, they asked for an edit, and my offer was contingent on it, and it was to remove entirely a paragraph that situated what happened to my grandparents as part of a pattern within American history and something that continues into current times. But not only that, they wanted me to remove the word racism altogether. Takuda Hall refused, posting her experience with the publisher on her website and a tweet, which soon went viral, making her experience headline news. Now an East Bay author has found herself at the center of a teachable moment about censorship. Scholastic retreated on their demands and apologized, but for Takuda Hall, it wasn't enough. I would just like to say, I wish I could accept this deal. <laughs> I just want to be really clear about that. Like, I would love to license with Scholastic. It's not that I think I'm too good for them or anything like that. Um, but because this ended up getting more attention than I'd kind of initially anticipated, I understood that I ended up being a stand-in for a lot of people, um, for marginalized authors all over the country who are asked to make these kinds of choices all the time. I don't think that any marginalized author should have to sand down the rough edges of our lived experience to make our stories more acceptable to white people or to heterosexual people or to cisgender people. For Asian American Life, I'm Ernabel DeMillo. Mott Street cuts right into the heart of Chinatown, but for CUNY professor and author Ava Chin, it's been home for more than four generations of her family, and it's the subject of her new memoir, Mott Street. Mott Street is, it's like, it's, it's almost a metaphor for the ways in which people come together under difficult circumstances. Mott Street, a Chinese-American family's history of exclusion and homecoming. Chin traces four generations of her family all the way to the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad in the late 1800s. Ever since I was a little girl, my grandfather would regale me with stories about his grandfather, who worked on the nation's first transcontinental railroad, which at least physically united the country after the Civil War. But when Chin went to grade school and learned about the completion of the transcontinental railroad, there was another story. The Chinese immigrants who built the railroads were literally out of the picture. There wasn't a single Chinese face staring back at me. And I thought, what is this nonsense? It set her on track to delve into her family's history. The message that I got was that we didn't matter and that our stories didn't matter and that we could be erased. And so I think that that was really the genesis for my being a writer. I knew that this was wrong and I knew I wanted to bring our stories to the forefront. Her research began in earnest as an undergraduate student at CUNY's Queens College. She got a chance to visit the genealogy library in Salt Lake City, Utah, where she found her great-great-grandfather, 
listed in the U.S. Census of 1870. I was able to find references to my railroad worker great-great-grandfather, whose name was Wong Yuan Sun. To see it confirmed in the census that he was actually, his, his name was listed out, um, his occupation, uh, it gave me a piece of the puzzle that I didn't have before. It was confirmation of the things that I had learned from the family lore. Chin examines how her family was directly impacted by the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, which blocked immigration of Chinese nationals from the United States for more than 60 years. The Chinese Exclusion Act was a watershed moment for our country. We were trying to decide who is an American and who is not, who is one of us and who is not. And the decisions that were made back then in the 19th century set us on a course as a country towards seeing all Asians as being foreign and suspicious. Chin says riding Mott Street during the pandemic and at the height of anti-Asian violence was sobering. The roots of the anti-Asian sentiment go all the way back to the 19th century when Chinese exclusion and that anti-Asian feeling um, was incredibly potent in this country. It's just laid dormant for since that time. The only way in which I found it easy to gather the strength um, you know, to combat this was really to continue to do my work and also the knowledge that my family members had gone through periods like this before, earlier in American history and survived. Mott Street is where the Chin family thrived. When Chin, who was raised by a single mom, finally met her estranged father, she would discover that both sides of her family occupied the same building on Mott Street at the same time. So it turns out that both sides of my family were upstairs, downstairs neighbors from each other. So my maternal grandmother's family were upstairs neighbors to my father's family. Chin admits that one impetus to write the book was her yearning to understand the father she never knew. But she says her intention to weave her family stories within the record of US history never wavered. The great aim of this book is to remind people of that and to put our Asian American stories into their proper space, into the larger American story. Mott Street is available at your local bookstore. For Asian American Life, I'm Rainer Ramirez. Beatles band member George Harrison called him the grandfather of world music. But before Ravi Shankar was a worldwide legend, he was a visiting professor here at City College, and he left behind a precious resource. They're demonstrating how Indian music is taught, how the teacher is going to sing a line and then, the, and then the performer plays it back. So it's sort of a call and response or a recitation. So check that out. So that's Shankar singing. And that's Ashish Khan. Housed in archives and special collections at City College is a course in classical Indian music, taught by none other than the legendary musician, composer, and sitarist Ravi Shankar, who's credited with bringing Indian music to the world stage. These are one-of-a-kind recordings, um, and they happened at a, at a very unique moment in Ravi Shankar's career. He had just performed at the Monterey Pop Festival in the summer of 1967, or the Summer of Love, which is really sort of his introduction to the West in a popular culture sort of context. And from then on, his career kind of skyrocketed. So when people heard that he was teaching at City College and that the class was open, actually, to anyone who wanted to attend and just listen along, I, there was about 400 people who filled the hall to, to hear the, the first few lectures. That was the fall of 67, when Shankar was invited to teach as a visiting professor at City College by close friend and professor Elise Barnett. The chair of the music program 
had asked uh, Professor Elise Barnett, who had a specialty in Indian classical and Asian music, to find the best Indian musician that she could find to teach a full semester-long course on uh, the theory and practice of Indian classical music. It was Professor Barnett's inspired idea to preserve the teachings of the four-time Grammy winner by recording them on reel-to-reel -reel audio tapes. CCMY then collaborated with the Ravi Shankar Foundation to obtain a grant from the Grammy Museum Foundation to preserve the tapes. It's not an hour-long sitar concert. Mm -hmm. It's Shankar um, explaining um, and his passion for the history of this music comes through because he goes very deep into the origins of this music um, and the history of India and the people. The recordings are of his lecture presentation and his performance of musical excerpts where he's making certain points about certain rhythms and uh, musical phrases within tropes within Indian music. We can immediately recognize the raga and the recognizable feature of Hamir is This always is repeated as the main feature. And I mean, this clip right here speaks to the importance of sound recordings when teaching this kind of music and any kind of oral tradition. Uh, you need to hear it. Mm -hmm. You can't just read it off a page, you know. An amazing resource that wasn't only available to students. You would have other performers and practitioners of Indian music that would show up just to listen in. Um, for example, like Colin Walcott, who uh, went on to create sort of his own genre, it's called Indo Jazz, uh, with his band Oregon. He would attend every one of those lectures. A lot of behind the scenes legwork went into supporting this class with a curriculum that included a phenomenal Indian classical record collection that's still accessible to students, along with the Shankar recordings, which are available throughout CUNY. When you walk into a library, you should be able to stream the recordings and see the scanned um, print materials that uh, were handed out in the class. So you could sort of run through and teach yourself these lectures uh, if you wanted to. The recordings are also available to community members. So if you live in the neighborhood, you can become a friend of the library to get courtesy access to lessons from a legend. For Asian American Life, I'm Susan Jun. Ready. <clears throat> Embroidery is often considered a mere craft. In Asian culture, though, it's an elevated art form. You're about to meet a master embroiderer and scholar of textile art whose own work with filaments as fine as a hair evoke moods like a painting. Why do you have to do this? It, no one says uh, the thickness I can use. Oh. From hand twisting strands of colored silk to get that special sheen. I want to make it a little bit good, you know, so. To stitches, some no longer than an eyelash. Dr. Young Yang Chung calls Asian silk embroidery painting with a needle. She's been practicing this art of fine points since she was a girl and teaching since she was a teen. This is my life. When I sit in the embroidery uh, stretcher, it's my, I don't think anything else. It makes me happy. Stitching is meditation, kind of a discipline. A quarter inch can take two hours. Her work leaps off the canvas, the three-dimensional effect painstakingly stitched shade by shade. Chung's 10-panel Korean folding screen of Fish Under the Sea exhibited in New York in 2017, but it first appeared 50 years before in the South Korean president's official residence, the Blue House. When Korea's current first lady visited Washington this year, Chung greeted her as a member of the board of the Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art. Embroidery is, is not, it shouldn't be a, just a categorized uh, craftsman skill training. It's not. It has a history. How do human beings become the decorated themselves to uh, communicate with each other? It's not just because uh, uh, fashionable. 
But fashion is how it began. Chung taught women who were desperate for a marketable skill after the Korean War. As a matter of fact, my father kicked me out of school and teaching people in embroidery. And I was young. He was upset? My father wanted me to go to school. I liked more teaching than the school. After securing contracts for her students' embroidery and answering invites to exhibit her work, including from the Shah of Iran, Young Yang Chung earned her master's, then PhD, at NYU. Her dissertation became the basis of her first book, The Art of Oriental Embroidery, the first English language reference work on embroidery from Korea, China, and Japan. The Embroiderers Guild of America called it a definitive guide. I went everywhere <clears throat> to see any article. There's only one place is a Metropolitan Museum has uh, some embroidery collection, which was uh, the Haven. That Haven was the Met's textile study room, where Chung met her research mentor, textiles curator Jean Maley. She said she kind of sat at the the feet of Jean Maley to, to learn and then to come into the Met and to go into storage and to see a lot of textiles. In the museum's collection today, Chung's tribute to Maley, a reimagined rank badge from Korea's last ruling dynasty. The pink patch on the peacock's head, the fruit and flowers address the patriarchy of the Choson era. Rank badges, not surprisingly for a Choson dynasty that is was very male dominant, you know, was for, for men. And here, Dr. Jung um, was kind of flipping that around. Embroidery is an extremely um, meticulous kind of practice to be engaged in, and to do it well is really as is a painstaking process from um, the design aspect to the execution. Dr. Jung's work shows all of those things that she has invested in, not only in learning about the past, but also executing all of these things with her own hand. Connection to the past through her practice is why Chung established an embroidery museum at Sukmyung Women's University in South Korea and the Solwon Foundation in the U.S. With both, her work and collection of embroidered artifacts honors the kind of wonder that inspired archaeologist Sir Mark Oral Stein. He traveled the Silk Road a century ago. Oral Stein find uh, 1920 discovered that embroidered seven stitches. Some of those stitches, like the ones in this 8th century Buddhist tapestry from the Stein artifacts collection at the British Museum, are still taught and used by Chung today. Satin stitch, diagonal satin stitch. Diagonal satin. Timeless technique that Dr. Young Yang Chung has elevated one stitch at a time. For Asian American Life, I'm Vivian Lee. I'm Kyung Yoon. At a time when it seems like all things Korean, from K-pop to K-dramas to Korean food, are surging in popularity, some are hailing Korean rice wine or makgeolli as the next alcohol trend to watch. Alice Chun is the founder and master brewer at Hana Makgeolli, a brewery in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, and the only one of its kind in the United States. She is passionate about making authentic rice wine that follows traditional fermentation methods. Makgeolli is a type of Korean rice wine. Despite our namesake, the category overall is more accurately referred to as su which is the general term for alcohol in Korean. Traditional sul is defined as any kind of grain. Here, it's organic rice that is fermented with nuruk, a traditional fermentation starter and bacteria that breaks down the structures into sugar and turns the sugar into alcohol. Cleaning, cooking, Draining and fermenting the rice is a labor-intensive and time-consuming process, but Jun insists on honoring and upholding the handmade traditions. The methodologies differ from like your typical sake making process where your nuduk is introduced from day one, you have true parallel fermentation from day one, the times at which you feed it into the brew, how you're cooking that grain, how long you're fermenting, um, these kinds of variables generally are more laborious, take longer, um, and produce more incredible flavor. 
Alice showed me the tanks that she custom designed for Hannah Makali to mimic the handmaking process, acting as both fermenters and cookers with powerful agitators inside. She even let me sample a sip of Makali in the making. This is a brew that's about five days into fermentation. Um, it's very, very young, and it's not even completed in... So there's no alcohol in this, right? No, it should be quite sweet, actually. It looks like milk or yogurt. It tastes like alcohol. <laughs> Alice was born in Northridge, California, just outside of Los Angeles, the daughter of Korean immigrants. She remembers learning how to make fermented drinks from her father, who was a home brewer. And she credits her parents with instilling in her an entrepreneurial spirit. My mom was an oriental medicine practitioner, an acupuncturist. She had her own clinic after immigrating to the U.S. And my dad, he eventually opened restaurants all over the Central Coast. Growing up in that kind of environment was, I guess, also business schooling. Um, and on that note, my parents are very proud that I'm following on in their footsteps and kind of doing something of my own. So they weren't the typical Asian tiger parents? Um, no, they are not your stereotypical, like, tiger mom, tiger dad. But the way they always put it to me was like, you can do whatever you want. You don't have to be a doctor or a lawyer, um, but you just have to be the best at what you're doing. When Alice was six years old, the family moved to the central coast of California, where she grew up in predominantly white neighborhoods, disconnected from Korean culture or community. I was bullied a lot as a kid for being Asian, um, for being different, and it's a survival instinct, you know? You have to try to fit in so that one, you, you, so that you can protect yourself, but as a result, you kind of reject your own heritage or you have to reject your Korean or whatever um, culture, um, cultural identity that you have. Alice says today she is proud that her work is dedicated to preserving Korean traditions, and she's grateful that the journey has made her embrace her heritage. To be Korean American and then to try to claim traditional product as our own and then bring it to a market is not an easy feat by any means, but because we're Korean American, I think we were able to add a bit more of a modern twist to it. Um, we can speak to the American market in, in a more comprehensive or understanding way, in a resonating way, is I guess the better way to put, put it. Um, and it's because we're also American. Alice Chun says she wants to scale Hana Makali and grow her business, but her larger vision is to make Makali and Korean Seoul not just a trend, but an established category in America and the world. I'm Kyung Yoon for Asian American Life. That's our show for now. Thanks so much for watching. And be sure to come out to Staten Island to check out the New York Chinese Scholars Garden. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok at Asian American Life. I'm Ernabel Danilo. We'll see you next time.